I was talking to a friend the other day, and we got onto the subject of fans and fan culture. Being a fan is something very different than being into something. Being a fan of something implies something stronger than admiration. Being a fan seems to transcend the work and occupy an area where devotion lives, and from devotion comes euphoria and loyalty and anger and betrayal. The topic came up because I saw a tweet in which there was a competition to spend the day with X celebrity and X situation, and I thought it would be one of the most unpleasant ways to spend a day that I could think of, apart from the thousands of conceivably worse days, but you know what I mean. Can you imagine it? Winning a day with that celebrity you really like. The pressure on them to be charming and entertaining and glittering and fabulous for the whole day. Then you're stuck in the hugely uncomfortable situation of having to be charming yourself and, and spending a whole bloody day with a person who has been literally paid to spend time with you. I don't care how many episodes of Star Trek Deep Space Nine they've been in, no one deserves that day. Then again, I'm not a fan. I like watching an actor act or, or reading what a writer has written, but I have no real desire to meet them. I mean, what if they think I'm an idiot? What if I think they are? My skin is shifting with a, with a simple thought of it. Then a couple of hours after this conversation, I was asked a question on Twitter. It was the classic dinner party question, but with games. If I could pick five people from the whole lifespan of humanity to sit at my table to play games with, which five would I choose? Now, I'm not going to criticise the fact that finding a decent six-player game would be a nightmare, and to answer the question in the spirit it was intended, I'm going to do this? Who do I admire? What does that say about me? And could it be said that I'm a fan? Now, how do you come up with a list like this? It, it needs to be pitched correctly. Too high-minded and you appear pretentious. Too low-brow and you stink of knowing irony. And everyone knows how rancid that smells. I wish to appear well-rounded, urbane, bright, with just a little affable mischievousness. The fact that this bears no relation to me whatsoever is by the by. One of the powers that the pen possesses, and now the camera, is the ability to erase faults, and I'm using that function with as much gusto as I can manage. So thank you for indulging my need to extemporise, and without further ado, I'll come to my first choice. There are people whose lives are one constant disavowal of the normal, the average, the mediocre. There are those that lead cesium lives, their days an endless picaresque. They, they bounce from event to event as if history is one great big chain of trampolines, and once they jump on the first, they have no choice but to keep bouncing until they fall off the end. Historical biography edits out the boring bits, and I'm sure their lives were filled with silent meals and moments of staring out of the window. But when you look at their lives as a whole, you wonder how they had the time to fit it all in. Thomas Paine was one such person. He was not just a man that lived through the Enlightenment, but he helped shape it. He was an orchestrator of both the American and the French revolutions, an early prominent abolitionist, and one of the best-selling writers of the 18th century, and a lifelong fighter for those who had no voice. Not only that, he was bloody funny too, and such a significant figure that John Adams, the second President of the United States, said of him, without the pen of the author of Common Sense, the sword of Washington would have been raised in vain. I would go so far as to say that Thomas Paine is one of the most important people you've never heard of, especially if you're from the nation of his birth. He was born in Norfolk in 1737, and history first cocked its ear in his direction when, as a customs officer, he was embroiled in a heated parliamentary exchange when trying to assert his rights. His life in politics and letters didn't really kick off, though, until he was introduced to the mathematician and lover of fermentation, Benjamin Franklin, who suggested 
he might make a go of it in the colonies. Payne, who had had a number of failed businesses, was a widower and a divorcee when he nearly died making his way over to America. Thankfully, Franklin's physician was on hand to help him through his six weeks of recuperation after the voyage. It seems that such torpidity spurred him on when he eventually strode into the colony. One of his first tasks was, as the editor of the Pennsylvania Magazine, to anonymously pen a scourging of the system of slavery in his essay, African Slavery in America. In this piece, he called the business of owning other people execrable business and an outrage against humanity and justice. He would plant his foot firmly into history a year later when he published the clarion call for the American Revolution. This pamphlet, called Common Sense, sold 500,000 copies in a nation of two million people. Literally a quarter of the population bought his book. A quarter of the population were ignited by one of the most acerbic and witty rebuttals of the anachronistic and unjust system of inherited privilege that has ever been written. Those figures, well, they're simply staggering. Common sense is a disemboweling of the monarchy. It is rigorous, febrile, hilarious, and, and righteously angry, and it's certainly no dry political screed. It's highly entertaining and eminently quotable. For instance, a long habit of not thinking a thing wrong gives it a superficial appearance of being right, and raises, at first, a formidable outcry in defence of custom. But the tumult soon subsides. Time makes more converts than reason. Or, give me liberty, or give me death. He was also not a great fan of inherited power. For all men being originally equals, no one by birth could have the right to set up his own family in perpetual preference to all others forever. And though himself might deserve some decent degree of honours of his contemporaries, yet his descendants might be far too unworthy to inherit them. In common sense, Payne spoke in plain English to a downtrodden people and elucidated their arguments for them. The fires of revolution were fanned by Payne's wit and brilliance. One revolution was not enough for Payne, though. He wrote many passionate defences of the French Revolution, and when, after moving back to Britain, he was subsequently forced to flee after upsetting the delicacies of noted conservative hero and grade-A bellend, Edmund Burke. So he decamped to France, where he was appointed part of the government despite not speaking a word of French, and he helped to draft the French constitution. Soon though, he fell foul of the flighty Robespierre and was thrown in Le Clink. The story should have ended for Thomas Paine with the fatal kiss of Madame Guillotine. But luck stepped in to save him from the basket. Prisoners that were to be executed would have a chalk cross drawn on the doors of their cell so the guards would know who to haul out and take to the Place de la Révolution. When the guard did his rounds with the chalk in hand, he failed to notice that Payne's cell door was open as he was receiving visitors. And he drew the cross on the inside of Payne's cell door. This gave Payne the time he needed to wait out the bloody rule of Robespierre, and it saved his life. After this brush with revolutionary justice, Payne settled down to more sedate pursuits. He wrote The Rights of Man, which sold a million copies. He patented a design for a single-span bridge, invented a smokeless candle, and built a steam engine. Payne died poor at the age of 72 in Greenwich Village, New York, and his funeral was attended by six people. One of the greatest men of the 18th century, in fact, the architect of the century. Without him, there would have been no American or French revolutions. Died and remained in obscurity, a crime that I hope history will pay for one day. Payne was undoubtedly one of history's heroes, 
an unapologetic progressive, he fought for the rights of all people. He fervently believed in freedom and wasn't cynical enough to consider that belief a folly. It's such a shame that he isn't spoken about in the same breath as Franklin or Lincoln. Payne wins a spot at my gaming table for all that he was and all that he gave rise to, but also because if his writing is anything to go by, I would be challenged and reduced to tears of hysterics every moment he sat opposite me. There are those who manage to cram in the lives of 20 in their brief sojourn on earth. Thomas Paine was one of these men.